All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, really excited about this talk. Um, we have our very own Michael Schrag with us uh, to talk about recommendations and the relationship between the self and identity and whether creating multiple selves for the purposes of recommendation is productive and in what ways um, really, really interested to hear uh, how this is formalized. And, um, and I also would highly recommend this book that he has written, Recommendation Engines. It's on a topic that is so uh, relevant. I was just having a conversation yesterday uh, about how, and this morning as well, about how relevant it is to so many facets of our lives now, even more so than about a year ago. So um, with that, I will let Michael take it away. I will just note that everyone should mute themselves, please, and turn off your videos so as not to distract. And then uh, we will obviously be um, monitoring the chat for questions. So please do uh, include your questions in the chat and I will do my best to uh, bring those to Michael at the end. And Michael, you don't need to worry about the chat I'll do my best to uh, to look I, at that. I appreciate that. Thank you All so right. much, Sonal. Thank, thank you so much, Carrie, and everyone, for uh, organizing and facilitating this. Yes, uh, it's wonderful to be able to give the April Fool's talk, uh, luncheon talk, and and this has really been a wonderful exercise for me to revisit some of the work that I'm I've been doing. Uh, this draws heavily from the "Who do you want your customers to become?" and the. The, the recommendation engines book that Sanan was kind enough to reference, and also a, a white paper that I did on selvesware for IDE a few years back. And you know, I sort of drifted away focusing on KPI issues, but this notion of selvesware keeps drawing me back. I'm really, really fascinated by it because I've always been interested in good recommendations, good advice, and how following good advice and good recommendations influences who I am and what I do. So with slightly tongue in cheek, I'm going to call this cells in the next AI, how augmented introspection, that's the AI transforms the recommendation. It's really about Freud 3.0, a better understanding of the dynamics of the self. Of course, the year before Freud was born, we had the poet Walt Whitman saying, do I contradict myself? Well, yes, I'm vast and contain multitudes. And that pretty much is the essential issue that I want to discuss today, because I think we are, pun intended, kidding ourselves in our design discussions, our software discussions, discussions about the self and identity. So this lunch talk is really going to be about why digitally deconstructing the self leads to better choices. The talk is really about how multiple selves transform human agency. And by agency, I mean the empowerment of choice, the ability of people to make choice. My argument basically is going to be that seeing yourself as selves transforms your notion of what agency means and improves the quality of recommendations and choices that you get. And just to establish the historical context for this, you know, from the Stoics, Epictetus, it's not your body or your hairstyle, but your capacity for choosing well. If your choices are beautiful, so too will you be. How do you get more beautiful choices to choose from. That's the issue, that's the theme. But the most important thing I think you need to understand today, and this is going to be developed at great and excruciatingly length, excruciating length later is, you need to understand that you are not you. That's critical. Whoever you think you are, you're not. I want you to be flexible about who you think you are and how you think you come to understand yourself and act upon those understandings as part of your quote unquote suspension of disbelief for this talk. Because what we're going to discuss is how technology can and should help you identify, manage and improve multiple selves. 
I do believe in defining my terms. This is my operational definition. For those of you who know the Herb Simon's Subjective Expected Utility School of Economics or the Austrian School of Economics, a multiple self is a digital version or representation of the self, however defined, however defined, with one or more key attributes or aspects measurably changed along a purposeful dimension. That is, you are choosing to amplify, exaggerate, or mitigate or ameliorate an aspect of yourself as you or someone else defines it. And my call to action from this talk is I think people in our domain need to thoughtfully invest in AI research, not AI per se, but augmented introspection. What should the AIX, the augmented introspection experience be? I am going to use recommender systems, recommendation engines as my platform, as my vehicle for exploring and discussing this. What better way to begin than with an April Fool's, but real cat video. I'm just delaying here to make sure that it loads. Um, one of the most important things in psychology, they'll tell you about consciousness, is the mirror test. <laughs> because some animals really do not do a particularly good job of recognizing themselves. Cats in particular seem to have a great deal of difficulty in seeing, understanding what it is they're, they're seeing. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a sort of a sad story here, but we'll, we'll stop. Um, whoops, there we go, whoops. Oh my goodness. Well, that's, that's my, my situation here. There we go. Dogs can recognize themselves, chimpanzees can recognize themselves, but the whole notion of a mirror raises the notion of how do we see ourself? How could or should we see ourself better? And does better seeing ourself influence our choice and decision? Increasingly, these questions and answers are digital. That's the critical thing to understand. I believe that digital transforms the technologies of introspection and by transforming the technologies of introspection, we need to revisit and reevaluate what it means to see oneself. There's a very profitable example of this from L'Oreal. They did the uh, makeup genius. Tens of millions were downloaded in, in China. It's an augmented reality thing. And basically it allows women to, in real time, it creates a magic mirror. You can see blush, you can see rouge, you can see lipstick. You can see different versions of yourself, the subjunctive self. What if I do this? What if I do that? It's a magic. It allows you to see yourself in a, in a different way. If I give you a mirror, do you see yourself in a different way? How do you see in a different, yourself in a different way? Does it influence the choices that you make? For L'Oreal, it was very successful. We have another example, augmented reality, and, you know, fitting rooms. You know, people get to see themselves in different kinds of clothes. Recommendations are made off of that. But the essence of that is there's a different way of seeing yourself, a subjunctive, a speculative way of seeing yourself. You don't freak out like a cat. You become more curious. Of course, we all know what curiosity did to cats. You have software that allows you to modify your appearance to age yourself. How does changing how you see yourself change the way you do introspection? I have a colleague at UCLA, Hal Hirschfield, who's done pioneering work in this, and we're working on a couple of projects together. And one of the things he's done by using aging photos is try to establish what kind of connections people have between their current selves and their future selves. And he uses these photos as a way of establishing or measuring in a crude, vulgar sort of way, how connected people feel 
to their future self. Now in economics, we know hyperbolic discounting, discount rates. The fact of the matter is he's done research that shows people who feel better connected to a future self save more money. Non-trivial sums, more money. Anything in his conclusion was, anything we can do to increase connection to our future self is something that can help us make better decisions. That's an aspect of a self. How might different flavors of a self change things? For those of you in interested in behavioral economics, what would it mean? How would it feel? Would you like to be nudged by your future self? To heck with the policy making of Sunstein and Thaler's libertarian paternalism. What would it mean to have your future self nudge your current self? It's not just visual mirrors, of course. We are living through the quantified self, self-knowledge through numbers, transformation, revolution. In fitness, it's already completely taken over. There are all, the human being, the human mind, the human body is instrumented in ways that it has never been done so before. It's been the democratization of data collection and distribution. The notion of me data, people are collecting 10 to 100 to millions of times more data. That's a trend, a structural shift that's only going to continue. The whole notion of self life logging and self tracking is really becoming a mass phenomenon or at the very least a popular phenomenon. IT in this context becomes introspection technologies. The people, people's ability, if they so choose to look at themselves in new ways has been dramatically expanded. I found this on the web doing a search. I like this Couchella, somebody a little frustrated with, with COVID as we all, doing beautiful data visualizations about how much time they spend watching streaming video. That's their representation and, and their patterns of, the, of this. You have other people developing very sophisticated, very comprehensive data mirror dashboards that track the variety of things that they do. These are data mirrors that facilitate and enable introspection. But we can go even further. You should check out this company, Exist.io. It's Australian based. This is software that actually looks for and identifies patterns and correlations and does characterizations of your choices, your behaviors, your consumption in your personal life. It's not your least active day, but almost. You've been mo more productive last seven days. In other words, there are ways of giving you feedback on you that you're in a position to respond to and act on in the same way that you see an aging version of yourself or, or yourself in different clothes. You're repackaging data to give you insight. And this is what I would characterize as the fundamental shift. It's a revisualization, it's an externalization of the mind's eye. These technologies transform the economics and the capability of externalizing introspection. So we're not just doing it inside our minds, we have external representations that allow us, that force us to see things and experience and understand ourselves differently because we're dynamically representing tracking and logging choices and behavior. So we can see things and then we can create a feedback loop. We can make a choice, we can uh, explore a recommendation and that becomes part of the data, that becomes part of the introspective loop. The intriguing and provocative thing to me is that virtually all of the essential cells or technologies that I'm talking about, these things exist. These things to facilitate and enable and support multiple cells exist. It just hasn't gone in that direction. But there is no technology gap. To me, the issue is more about what is the fundamental organizing principle for cells where. And I'm a little frustrated when I look at this because I, when we talk about improving quote unquote agency, what I see is different. I see people getting apps to amplify their self, to improve their self, how they see themselves. Or it's Alexa, will you do this? Alexa, can you do that? 
or you have bots, or you have, as you know, I was uh, uh, very friendly with Patty Mazes' group at, at the Media Lab, the software agents group, you have all manner of software agents that are, that are acting on your behalf, that are doing what quote unquote you, but remember, you are not you, want. I really wonder whether software agents, this is sort of like the design schism that I want to throw out there. I really wonder if better agents is the way to go for improving outcomes, for improving recommendations. I think you really need to use the self, not an agent as an organizing principle because agents perform tasks to deliver desired outcomes selves define tasks for desired outcomes. And some of you familiar with Darren Asimoglu's and David Autor's work on you know, the future of jobs, the deconstructing of a job into tasks, it's the same sort of thing that, that occurs here. I think we need to move away from, how do we do a better job of defining and automating a task to defining and augmenting a self? Here's the problem. The more you read on the literature of the self, the history of the self, the more complicated and confused it becomes. I'm not going to read all of these things for you. I would urge you to even look casually at the literature, whether technical or popular, on the nature of the self, because it's remarkable what little consensus there is in this regard, or how, you know, Zen koani it is. The self is what happens when I encounters me. Or there's certain schemas here. The self is a collection of multiple context dependent self aspects. The interesting thing here to me is all of these definitions can be useful in their own way, but all of these definitions suggest that perhaps we're better off not dealing with the self as a whole self but dealing with the self deconstructed aspects, parts of the self, whether Freud's id, superego, you know, and of course, what did Freud spend a lot of time talking about? Even if you had the id, the superego, and the ego, the unconscious casts an enormous shadow. Over it. So you, where does the influence come from on this? You see all manner of deconstructing, disaggregating themes. This was a very popular book, 60 years ago, games people play. You know, what are the roles? The parent, the adult, the child. How do people, quote unquote, relate to each other? Crude, simplistic, but revealing and powerful. And that's, we look at all the digital tools we have to deconstruct and disaggregate. I think that's very, very powerful. And we have an enormous literature to draw upon. I mentioned Epictetus, the Stokes. We have Descartes, the material notion, mind and body, Hume, who looked at the self as an illusion. You have Herb Simon, who challenged fundamentally the first generation of behavioral economics by saying, no, there's no homo economicus, there's bounded rationality. You have Tom Schelling, you'll notice the asterisk in a moment, wonderful essay from 40 years ago called The Intimate Contest for Self-Command. He coined the phrase egonomics. He talked about commitment devices that were very you know, macro ways of forcing you to behave in, in a certain way if you wanted to give up smoking or, or, or drinking. But the essence of his insight was you just can't treat the self as an integrated whole. We have our own Marvin Minsky, which I'll, I'll get to in a moment. And you have Kahneman and, and Richard Thaler, and a, a wonderful uh, Princeton researcher, Emily Pronin, who talks about, and I'll come to it in a moment, the introspective illusion. But what do all these asterisks stand for? Nobel laureates. The impact of how one defines a self and the relationship, relationship between how one defines a self and how one exercises choice and makes decision is one of the most important economic fundamentals around. I think that's key. With Marvin Minsky, you had the notion of, you shouldn't treat the mind as the mind, it's a society of the mind. And this played an enormous role in the kind of AI work that he did with, with, with Papert. The book is excellent, by the way, it holds up very, very well. You, you see this entire thing in, so, in social psychology, cognitive psychology, as Minsky mentioned explicitly, what you have really are modules of the mind. 
this essay by, by Kurtzman, Kurtzman's at Philadelphia, uh, are psychologists too selfish? Attacking the very premise of the field there that, that our, is psychology too focused on what is the self when in fact there are multiple selves. And this is the modular me that Jonathan Haidt talked about. Again, I don't need to read all of this to you, but we assume that there's one person in each body, but we're really more like a committee than thrown together working at cross purposes. My view is, oh, last one, uh, the introspection illusion. This is uh, uh, Plonin's work, also from uh, Pennsylvania. Very interesting. What she talks about is the cognitive biases we have when we do introspection. And that's why externalizing, building different representations of introspection is so powerful and important. My view is we should treat this modularity as a feature, not a bug. This is what digital does so well. We can disaggregate, we can come up with support systems, modular support systems, modular enhancement systems, and we move away from the notion of what does it mean to support a holistic self and say, what does it mean if we do a better job of giving insight into the modules? I think we should move away from the notion of the self and do a little Gedanken experiment, you know, from self to selves. Instead of self-awareness, selves-awareness. Instead of self-control, selves-control. Instead of self-discipline, selves-discipline. Selves-management. Quantified selves. Selves-knowledge. Let's move away from the fiction of a unified self and see what kind of advantage we can reap if we begin with the assumption that we're managing a multiplicity of selves. Begin with the collective, not with a fake holism, a fake unity. What are the essential selves intentionally that individuals have? What are the essential selves that we wish to cultivate versus mitigate? The ones we want to build on, the ones we want to repress or do a better job of making sure don't, quote, get in our own way. We talked about the future self. What would it mean to be more influential if we gave, if, if we wanted to become more influential in our interactions? What if we want to see what our choices are if we err on the side of being curious? What would a skeptical self bring in terms of the questions on the stuff that we read and the way that we engage? How would we amplify or augment the creative self? What selves should we be representing and externalizing? And this is key, the challenge of what kind of measurement? You know, for health, it's 10,000 steps. Well, what does that really correlate to? What does it really mean to be more curious? How would we assess that? I would argue that's going to be in the choices that we get. But note, everybody is familiar with the social graph. We have multiple selves. Why not a knowledge graph for the self? We see the way our internal self, different modules of the self interrelate and interact and combine or isolate one another. Where are the edges? Where are the vertices, et cetera? Alternately, curse of dimensionality, multiple dimensions. What are the similarities? If we're doing a recommender system, not just people like you, Curious people like you got this. Influential people, people who want to be influential like you. Skeptical people. What are the dimensions, novel dimensions, along which we should be looking to rethink similarity? All of the infrastructures are there for transforming recommender systems. What does it mean to come up with recommendation engines for multiple selves? That I believe is the interesting challenge. Now we can talk about it being provided from the vendor side. We can talk about if you have access to the data, you coming up with some sort of a personal advisor recommender so you avoid some of the ethical and privacy issues. But to be honest with you, I'm just interested in the notion of what does it mean to have recommenders for multiple selves? I talked with Marshall Van Alstyne on this, and he came up with a wonderful characterization that I'm not stealing, but, but I'm attributing. But basically what he says, you know, the way I was characterizing it and the way he reframed it is, 
what does it mean to move away from a centroid self to an ensemble self? We know from the Netflix prize and from all the way ML ops are deploying that machine learning does better in terms of predicting choice, in terms of making recommendations when they're ensembles. Well, instead of model A, model B, model C, it's self A, self B, self C. And you are training other data sets along the dimensions of curiosity, influence, or the essential self attributes, and which you can tune that can lead to the recommendation that you want. That's the hypothesis that multiple selves will lead to better recommendations and choice. So what we will get, what we will see if we have different selves are significantly different recommendations between people who seek to maximize versus people who seek to, we're calling Herb Simon, satisfice. What about mood tracking that we dealt with at Exist.io? What about the effect of self? Maybe you are more receptive to certain kinds of recommendations depending upon your mood or more resistant to certain kinds of choices depending upon your mood. This is a, again, context, friend. it's, it's the, the notion of the recommendation engine recognizing and adapting to one's self. I kind of like, and now we're going to move into, in the interest of full disclosure, I am talking with a number of organizations on how we do experiments and prototypes in this context. So I wanna talk about the, the inbox recommender. And we, we see the beginning of this with, with, with uh, Gmail. You want to send a note that's work related. Why not a recommendation on this already? But who else should be copied on this? Who else should be copied on the note? But let's add affective concerns to this. Who should be copied on the note to make you look smart? Who should be copied on the note to make your boss look good? Who should be copied on the to get constructive feedback? Who should be copied to advance your interest in another project? It is these aspects. This is not just about identity. It's what kind of self do you want to amplify and augment from a data-driven analytic sense? What kind of new options, new choices, different recommendations, novel, diverse, serendipitous, do you want to be exposed to because you are emphasizing this aspect of yourself versus that aspect of yourself? I love this example, just came out from Grammarly, sort of a variant on the IBM tone, tone analyzer. It'll analyze how your text sounds. You know, it basically it measures and monitors your tone. You, know, you want to sound friendlier. You want to sound more professional. You want to sound, I don't know, whatever kind of self you want to sound like. Grammarly will offer an analyze on this. Again, feedback loop. You can review which kinds of tones are, to which people your tone is appropriate, inappropriate, uh, more advanced. That's up to, it creates intentionality around externalized introspection. It's not just something that you understand inside your mind's eye or ear. It's something that you get to visualize and or experience in another context. You use this thing to, again, enhance persuasion and influence, linking the self network with the social network. How do you make recommendations that are more, or send out emails that are more influential? How do you suck up to your, if that's the kind of person you want to be? That's the kind of interesting option. If, if I really want to suck up, this is the way that that note should read. That's what the tone should be like. Again, we're going back to the notion of a subjunctive self. You want to be more artistic. You want to be more innovative. What aspect of the cell, how, can, how do you get options generated for you when you turn the dial up on your creative self? Again, there's no shortage of software now to augment. I'm not obsessed with cats, trust me on this. Uh, there's, there's more software now that allows you to play with the sorted options to define what kind of creative you wish to be. Okay, different genres, different kinds of mashups, different kinds of recommendations, different kinds of choices, all fitting within 
the recommendation framework that has been so successful for so many different organizations. My own view is that the future of performance management and with apologies to Laszlo Bach at Humu, who also wrote work rules when he was at Google, uh, the future of people analytics. I see attribute analyzer and amplifier as a service, as a, as a huge business going forward. I can see an Amazon offering it. I can see a Slack offering it through Salesforce. I can see GitHub, GitHub and Microsoft offering it. Um, the whole notion here is how do we let people, how do we empower people to pick what aspects and attributes of their professional self that they want to cultivate, develop, or manage better? And there are obvious implications of this. You give somebody a job review, give a student a review. Should you be able to impose a multiple self on a direct report? You say to somebody, you need to be more facilitative. You need to monitor your tone better. Should that person be obligated to craft a multiple self in response to your comment? The flip side is, whoops, the flip side is, how would you respond if your colleagues or your boss wanted you to create an aspect of a multiple self for you? I, depending upon who asked me to do it, I would, I would probably take it very, very seriously because it's a very clear signal, I'd be, be put in a feedback loop, it's a very clear si signal that my behavior, that my learning, my interaction needs to be augmented, enhanced, or changed in some sort of way. I kind of like the idea of being able to see what that self looks like, what the response of that self looks like. Am I comfortable with that or am I not comfortable? In the real world, this I want to credit my wife with, we're, we're, we're looking at the notion of how can we leverage existing platforms to rethink the notion of value added multiple selves. One thought in this era of diversity um, and, and equity and inclusion, let's call it linked inclusive. What if you had the ability to look at your LinkedIn social graph and see how, by whatever metric we choose, how diverse it was. Perhaps you're comfortable with your level of diversity. Perhaps as you look at it, you feel you are perhaps more exclusive than inclusive. Perhaps you would like to see what your network might look like if you incorporated greater diversity of connections in your first tier connection or had different communications or sharing with them. That would be a very interesting, your diverse and inclusive self. That would be a very interesting recommender and option to explore. Recommendations for who should be a part of that diverse, equity, inclusive social graph. I, because of my work with Hal, I'm very interested in the notion of the future self. What if LinkedIn allowed you to create a profile of yourself five years in the future, your future self. What jobs might you list? What skills might you list? Indeed, depending upon how you fill that out, you might get all manner of different invitations and recommendations from others or suggestions for classes to participate or people to follow based on how you want to create a future self. I think this is a pretty bloody good idea and that's one of the reasons why it's being discussed. Um, for those of you who like Spotify, I like this notion of a different persona, Spotify on deadline. You know, that's, the, I am uh, um, working on, on deadline and, and sometimes I like hearing music. Sometimes I like hearing a podcast. Sometimes I'm concerned about about uh, mindfulness, it would be very interesting for my, what, what should Spotify put together for my deadline self, my on deadline self that would motivate me, that would energize me, that would basically allow me to perform as I want to perform better, okay? This, we had the gentleman from Spotify a few weeks ago present. That's one of the reasons why I asked the integrative question. 
what, what would happen if you didn't just make the music or the podcasts the principle, but energy management, how an individual felt or wanted to be in a certain context, the aspects of self and circumstance that a Spotify uniquely could be able to organize, for want of a better phrase, playlist options around. This is a proposal, I put an asterisk here because it failed. I was talking, I, I'm just sharing this with you. Um, it, I, I had this conversation and, it, and because of COVID or other reasons it went nowhere. I was talking with, with the folks at, at, at Hallmark. I felt, and they still sell cards, they still do Hallmark TV. What I was calling for was the grateful self, gratitude as a service. Hallmark is a great gratitude brand. What should you be putting on your Google or Outlook calendar? What should you be putting in Amazon or Spotify that would allow you to and rec make recommendations for how you can express gratitude to people in your social media circles, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever? How can you, what kind of recommendations and choices and options could you have to cultivate and project a grateful self. It's remarkable what happens when you begin to pick aspects of self as design principles for recommendation and advice, rather than people like you. Going the ensemble approach, as opposed to the centroid approach, strikes me as a very powerful way of doing these things. Now, mind you, as with all recommender systems, you're going to have cold start problems. And one of the other things that I'm looking at is, you know, how do you do the elicitation of information around that? Well, what kind of chatbots could interview you or you could have exchanges with about what kind of future self you wish to be? What kind of curious self you wish to be? And these kinds of dialogues done from a coaching context or a mentoring context could inform or begin to populate the recommendations and the weights for the models and the modules to make recommendations for you. Ultimately, I believe that it's going to be very interesting because you know we're, we're all looking at our screens now. We have phones, but but there were also acoustics, and and then we began with the notion of of uh, augmented reality. I am very curious about what the augmented introspection experience is going to be like in three to five years. I think what we're going to have is a very, very interesting realignment between introspection technologies and choice architectures, the form factors for realigning introspection and, and uh, choice. I think that's going to be the biggest issue for individuals. I think that's what the quote unquote future of personalization is going to look like. Um, the implications of this I think are, are, are pretty serious. But from my perspective, I look at this as sort of a no-lose issue. I tongue-in-cheek have the acronym RAROI. It's not risk-adjusted return on investment, but recommendation-adjusted return on introspection. Pretty much one of two things is going to happen. If we give people the power to create multiple selves, and those multiple selves generate a genuine diversity of options and choices that push the efficient frontier out for better choice, the repercussions of that are enormous. Everybody interested in social network analysis is going to be spending a little less time on people's identity and a lot more time on how people choose to define themselves. Simple thought experiment. If Facebook allowed you to create five different versions of yourself instead of one true identity, wow, that would have, if there's real diversity there, that's enormous repercussion. That's enormous implications. Same thing for TikTok, same thing for LinkedIn, same thing for every social network. There's a flip side of that, which is what if multiple selves really don't move the needle? What if multiple selves don't really generate diversity of choice, novelty of choice, serendipity that matters? What if there's really not much of a meaningful distinction between choices and decisions and behavior between the centroid self 
and the ensemble self. Well, I think that would be very, very important too, because it would indicate that the notion of a self and self-understanding isn't all that important or isn't all that valuable. I don't think that's a likely outcome, but I think in the interest of scientific integrity and experimentational integrity, that's an outcome we need to consider. But I do want to conclude with the notion that I think the Oracle of Delphi and Tala, Talas were, 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 were wrong. It's not about how do I know thyself? It's knowing thyself. I think that represents this approach to choice architectures and recommendation and introspection, all enriched by ever increasing volumes of data and ever improving algorithms and analytics. I think that changing the unit of analysis from the self to a portfolio of selves with intentional attributes that matter to the user is empowering, important, and maybe one of the most important and significant changes in the way we leverage digital media and digital platforms. Those are my remarks. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and comments you may have. And uh, I'm, by the way, I think I can go into much, much, much greater depth on this tour the horizon. So feel free in that regard. So Nan, do we have yeah. any interesting questions or just greater skepticism? No, I think, uh, I think it actually provoked a ton of interest. Uh, people clearly fascinated by this topic. So you're onto something I think here. Um, let me run through a couple of the questions that we've gotten so far and, and see if, uh, if, if you having thought about this uh, for a while can elucidate a little bit. So uh, Lucinda asks, uh, she says, the LinkedIn future self is very interesting. Uh, could that include what skills, what attributes, what type of connections would that look like? I think you sort of answered that. And then she says, could there be some best next steps or a map to get from my uh, here me to my there me? And is that part of the roadmap? Um, well, you should participate in that kind of a, exactly. Here's my bet. My bet, and again, this I, I, there's a limit to how much I can, but, but yes, I'm talking with LinkedIn. They they have changed their recommenders, you know, who you should talk to, but but the, the, the notion is how much, if you're LinkedIn, I, I want to be careful how technical it is, I have a future self, okay? Do we immediately treat that future self as a real? This is what, what Lucinda is asking. Do we treat that future self as a real self and immediately reach out? But you may not be ready to take advantage of that. So what should the next, how would you interpolate to that? By the way, I have no idea. I have no idea, but, but picture this circumstance. You can look at, the, here's the, my obvious answer. We're back to similarity. We look at that future self. What does LinkedIn have perfect insight into? all profiles that look like that future self, if that's what you want to be. And it's gonna say, okay, these are the similarities to that profile. Let's look at the behaviors or the evolution from five years back of those people. Is it going to be a scatter plot or will there be altogether now principal component analysis, two or three common behaviors, common links, common whatevers, that lead to next best action or how to get from here to there. So this is one of the reasons, and thank you for asking, this is one of the reasons why I'm hoping that a LinkedIn takes these ideas seriously. Really fascinating. I think there's so much here. I think it's great. Uh, Renee is asking about the sort of performative aspects of the self versus the actualizing aspects of the self. So she's asking, um, you know, do you think a uh, second order effect could be that people would cultivate, for example, social networks that look inclusive but are not in their representative self? Uh, would they engage in the presentation of self via social network highlight reel in the same way that people edit their lives on social media? So the performative aspects versus the the real, you know, th th there's there's the the there's the there are the there's the notion of multiple selves 
Right. And that, that would be, there's the notion of multiple private selves, and then there's the notion of multiple public selves that may have a different purpose. Well, first and foremost, I, that's, and I don't mean to sound like a suck up, that's exactly the right kind of question, because in the same way you have people all together now, fake it till you make it in the, you know, with their selfies and their filters, absolutely you would have performative selves. I, I just want to be clear here. There's no panacea here. Your multiple selves may be just as miserable and dishonorable as you are. The, the point here, and, and, and you know, the, the, the research, I, 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 we could do another talk on, on, on this. The literature on self-deception, Robert Trivers, et cetera, is enormous. How do people kid themselves? My point is, 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 I don't want to say more idealistic, but more straightforward. You have a mirror, okay? You know, you can use the mirror to make, magnify and get things clearer or to, you know, soft focus and blur. So I, I absolutely believe, as Renee is concerned about, that there's going to be certain performative aspects. I think one of the ethical questions that's going to be uh, emerge is, you know, when you design your multiple self, do you, is it clear that what you're doing is performative and fake on, on this? That you're doing Potemkin, to mix a metaphor, Potemkin multiple selves. Um, yeah. But, but uh, just to stress this, this is not a, a you know, you will end up a better person. There are people who will abuse it in the same way. I mean, gee, I, I believe there's there's a, somebody who wrote a book about, you know, about hype on social networks that instead of using it to better communicate accurate truths, they're using it to spread them. Absolutely, you'll have fakers throughout. Um, and, and who knows, maybe the pathology of multiple selves will end up rivaling or replicating or emulating the pathologies of, of social networks. I'm simply saying that as a design and organizing principle, the multiple self is underweighted and undervalued versus the holistic self. So that so Irving asks uh, along those lines, uh, what would it mean for social media to make uh, more positive recommendations uh, rather than just um, uh, assigning selves to us based on our past choices or uh, trying to improve our engagement? Is there a way, is there, is there a, so, so you, you, you just alluded to the sort of positive and negative elements of this. What's the path towards the positive? Well, <clears throat> the, the path to the positive, and this is, this is going to be a quasi weasel answer. Um, the quasi weasel answer is the, the literature that I believe does the best job of articulating this is the behavioral economics literature around choice architectures and defaults. What are the defaults? You know, this is the libertarian. I, libertarian paternalism is presented as a policy approach, you know, the nudge unit in the UK, you know, various kinds of, of, of you know, we default into contributing into uh, our retirement accounts. I believe that the, the, the Nobel Prize winning work in choice architecture design and mechanisms for choice architecture design will be the way to, if, if not minimize regret. Uh, uh, minimize opportunities for exploitation and bad choices. It'll be clear that these are bad choices. But you know what Irving is really asking is more of a policy question. You can see my focus here is how do you give, how, how should technology improve agency? And to me, the best way of improving agency is not building a better self. It's building a better portfolio of multiple selves. Uh, David George comments that uh, we need to find a way out of the history repeating itself syndrome is currently implemented by social media, which is along the similar lines to what Irving noted and what you're talking about. If I, Sinan, I'm going to do a bit of advertising and say, I think that's a perfect question for your social media summit. Don't you agree? It's certainly one, yeah. So, uh, a lot of people thanking you and so on. Question from me, since we've exhausted some of the uh, questions on the chat is, uh, what about the, is there a, a cost to the, the fractionalization of the self uh, emotionally? 
Um, is there, is there, are we missing a, a positive benefit to the unified notion of the self that, uh, that we become, for lack of a better word, a little schizophrenic uh, in a world where we're inundated with prompts to consider our multiple selves, future, past, and present? Well, there, there are many people who would say that, that you know, um, people will be overwhelmed by choice, et cetera. One of the good things about recommendation engines, and you know, th th these are design heuristics. I pick when I work with organizations, you know, what, what, what I, you want the, the choices to feel, it, remember they're called recommendation engines, not compliance engines or do it or else engines. You want people to feel empowered by the choice. Does the choice, do the choices that we get feel, if I emphasize my curiosity thing, I wanna be challenged, but do I feel it's empowering? Do I see myself in, in that? Do I, do I see, does it resonate with an aspect of myself? It should, because it comes from an aspect of me that was amplified or mitigated. And the third is, is this a part of the process of who I want to become in the future? And just to put a stakeholder here, uh, a stake in the ground here, this is some of the work that I'm, I'm working on with uh, Dr. Hirschfeld, Professor Hirschfeld uh, at, at, at UCLA. To what extent might a notion of a future self be integrative if we're always being fragmented in the, if it's multiple selves in the moment, what's our North Star? What's our guide? What's our destination? So does a better articulated future self influence, measurably influence the coalition, collaboration, cooperation, reduction of uh, coordination costs with multiple selves in the moment? That's a testable hypothesis. I just wanna stress, without the networks that we have, without the introspective technologies that we have, this would have been a theoretical question even five or six years ago. Now, I believe, uh, let me, let me go back, connect this to your previous question. Perhaps one of the ways to set up a counterweight to the pathologies of social media networks is to really push people to become more introspective around their own choices. But the, the pushback is, that Renee raised is also possible. You could, it is, is it possible to end up with, with the boast, with the worst of both worlds? You know, crappy multiple selves and crappy social networks. Yes, yes, yeah. they're, 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 they're absolutely possible. I, I don't think, remember I quoted the Stoics. I don't think we're fundamentally changing human nature here. I think we're fundamentally changing the quality of people's choices. So Alan uh, Davidson asks uh, a, an important question about accountability and e you know, whether it's norm-based accountability or even legal accountability, um, you know, how do we account for social norms or legal structures to account for the actions taken by multiple selves? When are the actions of myself attributable to my identity? How do we create room for experimentation in ourselves while not allowing people to avoid responsibility for their selves? Great question. I'm, I'm going to give a non-total weasel answer to that. You know, the, the when, when I, as you recall, and this was an issue for me, I deliberately drew a distinction between selves, selves and agents, okay? Ultimately, you are being informed by different aspects of yourself that you have chosen to weight differently, but ultimately it is your choice, your collective, the executive self, it is your choice. I do believe without hesitation, remember I talked about uh, uh, attributes and aspects as a service. I believe that, let's take the tone analyzer as, a, as an example. I believe that if you trust the recommendations of the tone analyzer over time, you will convert that self into an agent that takes actions. And that's when Mr. Davidson's, Alan Davidson's questions arise. I believe that's going to be a doctoral thesis for the future, which is how do we transform or transition working selves 
working aspects into agents. There'll be agent migration paths in the same way we have remote process automation. Gee, we've got it down. Gee, we're in a stage where we can automate this. So the whole notion of how do we automate a self is going to become an issue. But notice here the difference. A self has a certain degree of attribute and affect, whereas with agents, it's task performance. So here we're talking about translating an aspect into an into a, a, an agent, as opposed to task management into an agent. Um, so that, that that's a long-winded way of basically saying, I, you know, ultimately you're responsible. The purpose of, what, of a recommendation here is to the purpose of the recommendation here is to improve the quality of choice and your confidence in why yourselves are presenting these options to you, not in outsourcing it to a digital platform. So Lucinda asks about the, the, the temporal permanency of the selves, which I think is a really interesting uh, concept. So how does how brief or temporary a particular self is affect um, you know, how it's used or the impact that it might have. So, you know, for instance, she says, um, you know, I can be super angry at my kid that my kid did something in the moment, but I still love him. And then can we have brief selves that can bet to buy, you know, that would buy something on an impulse or uh, do things on impulse. And then, you know, how impactful is the brief self versus the, you know, right. the more... <clears throat> Well, lasting self. Uh, forgive me for pointing out an, an obvious, but this is very much the kind of question that Daniel Kahneman addresses in Thinking Fast and Slow. And you know, I could have spent time developing that. That you know, what self? There's the thinking contemplative self. There's the pattern. You know, the instant self. Uh, if you were to Google or Baidu or Bing intertemporal selves in the economics literature, you will find literally thousands of papers and hundreds of models because hyperbolic discounting, discount rates, different selves have different discount rates and that creates internal conflict. You know, so even when you do these simple formality, you also have the, the arrow de brew, you know, the so if you take social uh, uh, um, um, the voting issues to and apply it to the self, you have those same levels of contradiction and, 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 and conflict. So, so the notion of how one manages selves in the moment, that's going to be a big, big issue. And I, and I really, I, my personal belief, and this is a belief, but it's a testable hypothesis. My personal belief is that within three or four years, we're going to have people with their, their um, AirPods their, their devices are going to be whispering to them, be quiet, turn left, you should talk now. I think there will be a lot of in the moment things. As we improve our ability to do mood tracking and tone detection, people are going to be able to, to your, 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 your device will tell you, perhaps you should calm down or Spotify will start playing a mindfulness or calming music thing. Some people are going to go the cyborg route in that regard. Other people are going to review things at the beginning of the day, review things at the end of the day. Other people are going to do things at the week. I think time is going to be one of the key discriminators for how multiple selves portfolios are managed. They'll be, forgive my comparison, the Warren Buffett fundamental value, multiple selves portfolios, and then there'll be the momentum People in the people whose selves are always in the moment, and they're looking for an edge or looking for advice or recommendation in the moment. I, I think time is going to be one of the most important discriminators on this going forward. So uh, we've come to the end of our time, ah. but I think that you have uh, really opened up a really uh, interesting question. There's clearly lots of. Um, interest here. I think you're on to a, a very uh, important topic and we're really happy to see you pursuing it. And thank you for sharing the current state of your thinking on it. Lots of great questions, lots of conversations to uh, jump off from here. I just want to remind everybody that uh, next week, April 8th, we have Florenta Teodoridis from USC talking about could machine learning be a general purpose technology, a comparison of emerging technologies using data from online job postings. 
Uh, and with that, I will bring us to a close and look forward to seeing everybody next week. Thanks Thank again. you so much. It was, it was a real pleasure. I hope people follow up. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.